The Center Steer Podcast, a Land Rover podcast by Land Rover owners. Welcome to episode 14 of the Center Steer Podcast, all the way from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's a lovely late May day. The weather is absolutely perfect. The weather is uh, clear. The temperature is about 75 degrees and the humidity is very low. I only report that to tell you it's a perfect day here in southwestern Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm John Costage, your host. Uh, it is a small podcast today. We are Only joining me is Harold. Say hi, Harold. Hi, Harold. <laughs> Everyone else is busy or doing something else, so I, I can see why. It, it, although not everybody here is here in Pennsylvania, but uh, the weather's really nice, so maybe that's why they're... They're doing their thing where they are. It's a good day to roll the sides and pull off the door tops. <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't pull my door tops off yet. I well, did, what's wrong with you? I, I, I got to get to the bolts. Uh, I did, however, drive the 109 yesterday. It was a perfect day. It was all, yesterday was just like today. Put the sides up, loaded the back up with a cooler, went over to visit my buddies and have uh, some, some dinner and some drinks. And 109 was absolutely fantastic. It was, it, just driving it was more fun than anything else. Kick-ass rugged, you might almost say. <laughs> almost, almost. As I said, this is a short, uh, not necessarily a shortened edition. We'll see how long we go, but certainly there's going to there's less of us today in the, in studio. Uh, today we're going to talk about a couple topics, and we will have an M word, and I think there's plenty on the docket to talk about. So why don't we go ahead and get to it? First thing is sales. We haven't talked about sales in a while, but Land Rover sales in the month of April were up 28 percent. Wow. Uh, conversely, Jaguar was down 10%. And specifically, I, and we only bring this up because it's interesting to know that, uh, say that things are going well, certainly in the world of Land Rover and that, you know, more and more sales means more money. More money means there's more they can do and keep the brand going. So now granted, uh, they sold 4,533 units in, in the United States and that was up almost a thousand units from April of 2013. And just to give you a little, that's almost 15 a day. Uh, yeah, and it, more in Pennsylvania because you can't buy a car on Sunday. That's a little interesting note. And Jaguar, well, not legally, not legally. That's true. Uh, Jaguar sold 1,035 units in April of 2014, and that was down uh, 100 units from 2013. Wow. So that's a bit of a dip. That is. I hope Jaguar uh, gets a nice little turnaround. Uh, next, a little follow on from the New York Auto Show. Hopefully you got to listen uh, to our last episode when we got to speak with Jeff Aronson about the New York Auto Show. And he experienced the uh, Land Rover Discovery concept uh, event. Uh, but the follow on to that is... That uh, there was conversation uh, that came out with uh, Jerry McGovern. Did I get his name right? That is correct. Uh, Jerry McGovern. He's the design chief of Land Rover. Not and, to be confused with George McGovern. And he said, uh, effectively, he said, don't worry about the DC 100 concept vehicle. It's dead. Thank you. And Finally. Some redemption. <laughs> uh, and it... And in further conversations, that uh, and I saw this on uh, CarAndDriver.com, and there was also a little bit of a report out at uh, Rover Parts, which is Atlantic British. And it sounds like they're going to go with these pillar concepts or family concepts. So you're going to have a Range Rover family or pillar. You're going to have a, a uh, Discovery pillar, which will apparently, as we'll, we find later, will include uh, the, the Freelander. And then there's going to be a Defender pillar. And it sounds like they're reworking this whole defender pillar because uh, if the way Jerry says there's going to be an – they want to have it make it very affordable and they want different versions for different things and you can move up through to a premium model. I, I like the idea that there's multiple offerings in the defender line uh, potentially, but – I think that the comment about the DC 100 is that they had, I think, enough negative response to it, and they decided it just wasn't sufficiently kick-ass rugged, so they had to go in a different direction. Absolutely correct. That's what it sounds like. And I do recall he made some other comments that uh, you know it's not going to look the same for traditionalists, but they're going to have to learn to live with it. And I'm okay with that, as long as it still represents the kick-ass rugged. 
hopefully that's the case. Well, it, I mean, it certainly got plenty of feedback, and apparently it has hit home, and they are uh, re-looking at things. Yeah. Now, I, I did notice that the, the some of the concept pictures that I've seen for the Discovery family seem to differ from the, what has traditionally been a Discovery in the past, styling-wise, uh, which is... A bit of a concern. I don't think it's as big of a concern for for purists as as the departure from the Defender styling. But uh, as long as a disco is what a disco should be, it's probably not as big a deal. But from what I understand, you know, like the split roof line is and the Alpine windows and things like that are are, are going to be disappearing from the disco lineup. Well, they were there, but they were very subtle. You had to you had to look for them. Well, just as even with the current disco, you know, the the Alpine windows are very subtle, and that step roof line is. Subtle, but it's it's still quite noticeable even from a distance. And it, it if they do have it there, it'll be just a very slight hint of what it used to be. And that if if they're, what they're doing is an homage to the, to the history of the Discovery line, okay, I'm fine with that. Yeah. The Discovery has never been as much about the look as a Defender has, hmm. in my mind. Okay. It's been more about getting the job done. And, and you know, it's a mid-range vehicle. It's not the the ultimate luxury vehicle of the Range Rover, and it's not the kick-ass, rugged, durable vehicle of the Defender. And it's not, you know, it was never meant to be as modular as the Def- as the Defender slash series line. Uh, it was just an interesting body style that they did. And so if they change it, I'm not as uh, offended by that. I-, I would like to keep some tradition there if possible. If they have to divert, they have to divert. So he uh, further said, you know, a Range Rover won't be doing the same sorts of things that the Defender will. They're not meant to. They're meant to do different things. So I think that kind of supports your point about... They never were meant to do the same things. Uh, it's, right. Even though they're close close to each other in the sense that they, you know, they're supposed to do sim- some similar things. You know, get you there, possibly you're not sure about the road, and you're going to get there in some style or less style. Yeah. It's all in, in which end of the spectrum you choose to optimize. Absolutely. So he ends uh, by saying from the reactions that we've had, our customers are telling us that they want a form, they want form, a usage, oh, they, uh, no, there's a typo in the article. They want from a usage point of view, from a capability point of view, and from a company point of view. But I think the approach that we'll have achieve, that we'll achieve will cover all those bases and the cars we still have, the essence of what Land Rover are about, but in a far more contemporary way. So the re- so the point of this is they're restyling the DC100 into something else, and we'll have to wait to see what that is. And what I'm taking from that is that they're even sort of softening their line of, of a few months ago where they're saying, we're going to update and you're going to have to live with it. it. Sounds like they're at least willing to concede that they need to preserve the heritage of the styling to a certain extent. Uh I hate to say this, but I don't know if I completely agree with that. I think it, some of this might just be changing his wording, and you know, it might be because you know, obviously he says contemporary styling, so I, I it might just be changing his wording. But at least he used the words that it has to still maintain. I, I don't remember the exact words you said, but but ma- maintain some. Um, essence of what a Land Rover is. Well, he says, and the cars will still have the essence of what Land Rover are about, but in a more contemporary way, which is, I think was exactly what he said about the DC-100. I think he was much less about the essence of what they're about at that point, mm-hmm. and get... more about what he thinks they should be. Well, I guess we'll find out. Time will tell. Time will tell. Uh, next up is the Land Rover Discovery Sport has been spied, and this was an article from InNews.com, uh, in Auto News, excuse me, in AutoNews.com, and the upcoming Land Rover Discovery Sport has been recently spied while it was being tested out at the Nuremberg Ring, and they come out and say, previously the, the known... The ruination of all cool things, according to James May. And the article says a previously known it come out and act, come, comes out and actually says previously known as the Freelander, the future Land Rover Discovery Sport is making a step towards in its development. Uh, recently tested on the Green Hell, and so apparently uh, the, the Discovery Sport is replacing the Freelander, at least based on this article. I did predict that. Uh, yes, and heavily influenced by the Avoc, and also by its uh, the Range Rover Sport. 
So well, if you remember when the when the Evoke was first being developed, it was based on uh, the LRX, which was believed to be the future Freelander. So it's it's not really a surprise that they would have a Freelander type platform, and it would make sense to offer that in both the Range Rover and the Discovery families. Right, and and we'll have pictures. If uh, I'll put the link on our uh, website, so go ahead out there and check that out if you want to see the photos. They're they give you a sense of it. Of course, they have all the camouflage on it, so it's tough to actually see what it looks like. But my con question is, so they're going to come out with the Discovery Sport potentially before coming out with the new Discovery, and yet they've come out with the Discovery concept and said, well, this was just a kind of a test vehicle. Uh, how much you know, is this new Discovery Sport going to... It seems like they're they're saying one two things at the same time. We're coming out with this new vehicle. It's going to look based on this family of vehicles, but the family of vehicles, we're not sure what it's going to look like yet. And I tend to think that if you're coming out with this entry level model, the sport, you've telling us what it's going to look like and what the whole family is going to look like. Cause they all kind of look a lot like each other. You know, the yes Range and no, cause the Evoke really doesn't look all that much like the full size Range Rover. Mm -hmm. I mean, it does yeah. to a certain extent, but it kind of doesn't also. So yeah, I think there's some latitude there. And, and, uh, you know, the fact that they've they've kind of had their eyes on this this Freelander and, and just a matter of where to position it, whether they have a Freelander model still or whether they, they call it a Discovery and do the Discovery family thing. And I think they had the model before they had the idea of how they were going to position it. So I think that's why they're coming out with that first. But I don't think it necessarily has to dictate design of the whole family. Well, that's good to hear because, uh, you know, the, the, the way that... I tend to think this guy looks uh, his sport looks a little blandish, at least based with even with the camp camouflage there. I'd like to see a little more. It has that front rounded nose that all the rent Land Rovers seem to have these days. Uh, it's you know it's got the cl cl clamshell looking bonnet, um, and but the back end looks eh. I don't know. I guess a lot will a lot will be kind of like a Ford, huh? <sighs> Yeah. From what I understand, that was sort of a criticism of of the discovery that was shown in New York as well. As it looked a lot like a like a Ford Escape, or maybe an Explorer. I think I thought it was an Explorer. Some people said Flex, but I think it looked more like a like an Explorer because it had that C pillar in the back that had that you know backwards kind of uh, slant to it in, yeah, the, in the C some, pillar. Some blandish tail lights too. And yeah, well, tail lights can be adjusted but you know the, the shape of the vehicle is usually set pretty much in stone for a couple of years that's harder to change yes yeah so i mean tail lights you can replug in but yeah so anyways it's uh the, so the the discovery sport is out being tested on the nuremberg ring and um, i guess we'll see when it gets to be in no 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 idea either on when it's going to be in in the showroom it'll but, be interesting uh, to see whether they launch that prior to the uh the rest of the Discovery family. If they have it ready, it would make sense. But on the other hand, if it steals the thunder away from the rest of the family, it'll be interesting to see what they do. Uh, so the, just looking at the article, article here a little more, the, uh, it's going to be getting prominent front grille flanked by swept back headlights. The model in question will also be getting a slip the roof line, dual exhaust, tailgate mounted spoiler. And as far as the yeah. engine, engine lineup goes, the vehicle will be able to carry over the units from the Avoc, including three diesel, uh, nope, excuse me, two diesels and a petrol, a uh, 150 horsepower, a 190 horsepower, two liter diesel, and a 240 horsepower petrol engine. Which will be the only thing we can get here, I'm sure. I, you know, I, that would, it would be it nice. It would be if, nice to have the diesel, maybe the they, bigger of the two, yeah. but the question is that, that's difficult to federalize quickly. If they haven't started doing that already, then they probably won't be ready. Maybe in a in a second model year or, or mm. later, it might be available if there's enough demand. I'd like to see it, but it's hard to say what they're going to do. Yeah. So look for the Land Rover Discovery Sport in your showroom, and, and if you get to drive one, let us know. We want to hear about it. We want a report. We want a report. Or better yet, bring it out to us. Let, let us hammer yeah, on it for right. a day. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we'll take. Yeah, we'll we'll take it off road. See how it does. Because you got to test these things. Absolutely. Yes. I I, I listen to uh, and and look at uh, Autoblog a lot and listen to their podcast. And those guys get to take out all sorts of vehicles and they get them delivered to their house and 
test them out. I don't know. Maybe someday we'll get to that stage. So if any of our listeners work for Land Rover Corporate, <laughs> keep this in mind. You need to bring us one to play with. That's right. Have it delivered to my home. Uh, or mine. I'm fine with that. <laughs> and now, the M word. The last Monday in May is a special day here in the colonies. It's known as Memorial Day a national holiday to honor those who have died while serving our country's armed forces. The three-day holiday weekend is also a time for families and friends to gather together, light the barbecue, and celebrate the beginning of the summer season. In addition to these special events, this is also a very big weekend for gearheads the world over. Since 1911, huge crowds have gathered in Indianapolis to watch a 500-mile race. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway was built in 1909 as a proving ground for automobile manufacturers to test their products and demonstrate them to the public. The shape of the track was unusual, not only for its day, but also by today's standards. It's not circular or oval-shaped, but rather more rectangular with rounded corners. The reason for this odd shape is because the builders wanted the longest track possible within the parcel of land they had purchased. Only a handful of races were held in 1909 at the 2.5-mile square oval before it became painfully apparent that the gravel and tar surface was not durable enough and was rapidly becoming very unsafe. Pavement was still a very new idea in 1909, so there was no easy answer. After a bit of research and testing, the track was completely repaved using 3.2 million bricks, each of which was laid and leveled by hand. When it reopened, the Brickyard, as it came to be known, was the finest motorsports facility in the world. Sixty-six races of various lengths were held in 1910, but then the owners felt that it made better business sense to focus on just one big race each year. On Memorial Day, the 30th of May, 1911, 80,000 spectators showed up to watch the first 500-mile race, and the greatest spectacle in racing was born. The race has since moved from Monday to the Sunday of Memorial Day weekend, but it remains as the world's largest single-day sporting event. With seating for more than a quarter million spectators and tens of thousands more camped out in the infield, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway is not only one of the world's oldest sporting venues, it also has the largest capacity. Thanks to television and the internet, millions worldwide will watch this storied racing event. Across the pond, this day also hosts the crown jewel of international motorsport, the Grand Prix of Monaco. In 1928, a small group of motoring enthusiasts, the Automobile Club of Monaco, was seeking international recognition, but were denied because they didn't host any local events. While they did host a road rally that was popular for many years, much of it was run on the roads of neighboring countries. In fact, Monaco is so tiny that the only way to have a race and keep it entirely within the country would be to run it in the city streets in the central district of Monte Carlo. With the full support of Prince Louis II, the first race was held in 1929. It quickly became one of the most popular in Europe and ultimately the most prestigious event in the Formula One World Championship Series. The course is technically very challenging with narrow, twisting roads, plenty of elevation changes, and even a tunnel. It also has some of the most beautiful scenery with mountains on one side and the Mediterranean on the other. If you ever want to see it in person, make sure you plan ahead and also take lots of money because tickets and accommodations are very expensive and they sell out early. Of course, if money is no object, the best way to see the Grand Prix of Monaco is while floating in the harbor aboard your private yacht. If watching taxi cabs bump each other around at speed is more your thing, then this is a big weekend for you as well. Originally known as the World 600 and later as the Coca-Cola 600, it's the longest race of the NASCAR schedule. In fact, fans will tell you it's the only 600-mile race in all of professional motorsport. It's the signature event at the Speedway in Charlotte, North Carolina, and one of the top five races of the NASCAR series. It was originally conceived in 1960 as a way to steal some of the thunder from the Indianapolis 500. Fans can debate whether it has done this, but in recent years, it has added a new dimension to the biggest day in racing. Since 1993, the Coca-Cola 600 has been an evening race. Therefore, it's theoretically possible to pull double duty and race at both events. 
It's really three races. Upon completing the Indy 500, drivers must dash to the infield to catch a helicopter ride to the airport and board a private jet waiting to take them to Charlotte and another short helicopter ride to the speedway. Even if they get out of Indy quickly and make the flight without delays, they will most likely miss the pre-race driver's meeting, the penalty for which is starting at the back of the field. If there are significant delays at the 500, it is possible to miss the beginning of the 600. Timing issues aside, it is also very demanding, both physically and mentally, to drive 1,100 miles in two different races using two very different cars. Only three men have been able to try it. A total of eight attempts have been made, and only once has a driver been able to complete all 1,100 miles. None have won either race while attempting the double. This year, NASCAR driver Kurt Busch will be the fourth man to do the double. Good luck, Kurt. Even if you finish both races, you'll be in rare company. And if you somehow manage to win either race, you'll have some serious bragging rights. And if, by the longest of long shots, you should win both races, there's a $20 million bonus check waiting for you. And you should probably retire, because you will never top that accomplishment. For fans of motorsport, the month of May is a very special time. There are lots of events, all building up to the magical Memorial Day weekend. So make sure you honor our fallen heroes and spend time with family and friends. But save Sunday for racing. It's the fastest day of the year. So there's an article uh, from supercompressor.com, and this was forwarded to me by Mark, one of our uh, normal panelists. 20 things you didn't know about Land Rover. And it's kind of fun. I think this is something that the average person probably doesn't know, but why don't we read through them and see what happens. So they dove into their past, Land Rover's past, and found 20 things you probably didn't know about Land Rover. Number one, Land Rover's been around 30 years longer than the company has. Uh, they were built in 48, and this, I think, harkens back to the fact that it's a, it's a, British Jeep, if you will. I think that's what that comment was about. Well, I think it might also be that, you know, the company wasn't known as Land Rover, and it was just a model within the Rover company until eventually the company became known as Land Rover. The first Land Rover had the steering wheel in the middle. So no one should, that's listening to this podcast should not know about that because that's the, where we get the name for our Gee, podcast. That's, that's, could that be why they call it Center Steer? <laughs> they really? S- hadn't thought of that. They sponsored the Ultimate College Joyride. So this was the Oxford to Cambridge first overland. Global fraternity prank at its uh, finest. Yes, and, and, and corporate sponsorship too. If you want to know more about the first overland, you should check out the video from Graham Aldis on the first overland. We, we talked to him a couple months ago back, I think, in February. Is the, that available at tiafit.com? It is available at tiafit.co.uk. Tiafit. Yeah, yeah, tiafit.co.uk. Tango, Echo, Echo, Alpha, Foxtrot, India, Tango. The father of Land Rover's larger offspring, the Range Rover, was a jet engine designing badass. Okay. He he worked with Rolls-Royce and helped them develop their first jet engine. Well, yeah, there was actually some M-word content about that a few months back, as a matter of fact. that At one point, Rover was doing the production on Frank Whittle's jet engine designs, but handed it over to Rolls-Royce for various uh, internal reasons. You could order a Land Rover with tank treads in the 50s from the factory. That's the Series 2 Cuthbertson, uh, apparently. Yeah, the uh, Special Vehicle Operations, uh, Special Vehicles Division uh, could get you various accessories and install them for you, or engineer something entirely different if you couldn't buy what you needed. Along those lines, they invented the first monster truck 30 years before anyone else. They're referring to the British uh, Forestry Commission of that the forestry off-road. Right, they put the, the big, huge tires on what was otherwise a fairly stock-looking yeah. rover. That was a one-off, by the way, which uh, which, which showed up in Graham Aldous's uh, video on Land Rover 65th birthday party, by Correct, the way. Correct, because it was at the party. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I'd be crushing much with that, but it'd be fun to, to run around with. It would certainly get through the bog nicely. They made the most grueling off-road challenge in the world their own for two decades. That's the Camel Trophy. 
Absolutely, and you left a word out of that. The first Range Rover was designed in the 1950s, even though the Range Rover didn't exist until the 70s. That would be the Road Rover, which was their first attempt at gentrifying the Land Rover. It was based on one of their road-going cars. But ugly, but an interesting concept. I, I found this one interesting. Not sure if it's how true it really is, but Land Rover hated paying taxes and went, great, went to great lengths to make sure their buyers didn't have to either. The Defender 110 could technically fit up to 12 people, qualifying as a bus by the taxman standards. The qualification allowed them to be exempt from the brutal tax system on passenger vehicles. Yeah, they, uh, a lot of people look for ways to avoid taxation, which is just fine, but yeah, that's one of them. The Range Rover was built exactly as the first prototype was designed. That literally never happens in the car industry, so they claim. Or almost never. It's, it's fairly uncommon for a concept to, to be taken straight to production. And the design was good enough to get Range Rover displayed in the Louvre. So it's art. I always consider, I actually think series trucks, well, almost every Land Rover, I think, is art. Well, I think most every vehicle is art. Not always good art, but art nonetheless. Art nonetheless. I have, uh, as you know, up in, upstairs, I have a frame photo from Land Rover's 50th birthday party poster that has the kind of the corner wing going down the side of the truck uh, of a, is that Series 2 or 2A? And it's, uh, it's, I had that framed. I like it so much, it's framed up on my wall. Nice picture. The first 25 pre-production Land Ro Range Rovers were actually called Velars, and apparently this was to camouflage the name. Okay. Uh, Range Rover won the first Dakar Rally, the legendary race from Paris to Dakar, Senegal. It was an all-French team, and they kind of ran away with it. That's, that's their comment. Uh, this one, I think they got wrong. They got it right in essence, but it's wrong in detail, Range Rover wasn't part of the same company. They claim that BMW bought Rover Group, that's the whole car group, in 94. They split Land Rover from Rover, then sold Land Rover to Ford in 2000. And then they remained different companies until Ford bought Range Rover in 2006. I think they added a Range Rover there at the end. They should have been, I think, just Rover cars in 2006. Uh, and they still are not quite correct on that, but... Uh... When uh, BMW sold Land Rover to Ford, Range Rover went with them because Range Rover was a model of the Land Rover company. Uh, the Rover name got split from the remnants, if you will, of the Rover group and went to Ford at the time when the rest of the Rover group was being sold to the Chinese. Another interesting fact that he doesn't mention here is that prior to BMW, Land Rover had an arrangement with Honda. Oh, I didn't, hear, I didn't hear about that one. It was uh, not so much a, a ownership uh, or equity transfer, but just a partnership, if you will. Uh, Honda was supplying cars uh, to the Rover Group. Uh, that was the Rover Sterling. It was the Rover Sterling and also the Triumph Acclaim. I don't remember the Acclaim. Uh, I think 1980 or 1981, Triumph stopped producing all of their cars and only offered the badge-engineered Acclaim which is just sort of a polite way of going out of business without losing your name, I guess. It, it looks like a, it, I, I pulled up, it looks just like a, a Honda Accord. Yeah, I think it was. It was just a rebadged Accord. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so it didn't, I don't know that it sold well, and of course it never was, was brought over into this country, so I don't know much about it. Remember at the time being a Triumph person and being quite disappointed that they'd stopped all the cars that I liked and were going to produce this badge-engineered Honda in its place. I remember, I remember the Sterling uh, being here in the United States, and that did okay. And then it, but I think the first or two years, and then it was kind of crappy, and I think it didn't sell well. I think there was something called the A twenty five also, but that might have just been a Sterling with a different badge on it. Uh, there was an A twenty five. I think there were two levels of Sterlings. There okay. was like the Sterling A twenty five, and maybe like an A twenty or something. Oh, that's what that was. Okay. I think there were just it was maybe slightly different engines. But it's been a long time. I remember seeing yeah, one at the Pittsburgh Auto Show. Way back when, I don't know why. It's, uh, well, it's it was... been 30 years, I think, since that was... was really? Happening. It's been that long? Yeah, I know. Time flies, doesn't it? It does. But the really interesting thing uh, about this relationship with Honda was that you could buy a Discovery in Japan... What? ...with Honda badging on it. No. Absolutely, you could. <laughs> Look it up. Please. 
Yes, it's the Honda. Uh, we should see. We should have a quiz, and then this would be a good, a good, a good podcast quiz for our we listeners. Should send this back to the guy that posted the twenty things. Did you know? No, that's yeah. We well, yeah, that's a good idea. The Honda Crossroad. It was. It actually refers to two specific models made by Honda. One of them was a rebadged Land Rover Discovery Series One, and the other was a completely different model they introduced in '08. Which we don't care about so much. We, we care no, about the Discovery. The of Discovery. So they just. It just sounds like they just rebadged it and. And if you if you look it up online and look at pictures, it's pretty funny. It's just a Discovery with a funky looking grill on it. Yeah, they uh, and uh, there's a little bit of here on Wikipedia about it, and it says Honda bought the rights to the Land Rover Discovery from Land Rover and had it placed in the Japanese SUV market for a short time before the partnership ended when BMW bought Land Rover. Some of them had been sold as well to New Zealand. But there you go. So maybe somewhere, maybe one of our New Zealand listeners might in fact know about it, my own. A Honda Crossroad. Maybe they should ship it to us to play with. <laughs> oh, yeah. Get right on that. <laughs> so, dear listeners, I have Google imaged, searched Honda Crossroad, and it looks, in fact, like a Discovery, except they put a giant H in the middle. There you are. 20 things, now 21 you, things you did not know about Land Rovers. That's that article. If you want to read more of that article, uh, check online on our website, centersteer.com, C-E-N-T-R-E. And you, I'll have a, I'll put, we'll have a link to that article. Another interesting, fun thing that, that uh, we'll have a link to is owner explains the attraction of Land Rover Defenders. And I've, I found this on carscoops.com. And it's just a nice, well-done video. It has that uh, well-produced feel to it. He buy, he talks about how he bought a Land Rover Defender, and it's not a modern car, and he, that's, you know, it, it's not perfect, it's not pretty, it's not luxurious, and, and he doesn't, that's what he doesn't like about it, but that's also what he loves about it. Well, he's and, preaching to the choir here, so. Exactly. It's a nicely, nicely little, 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 little done video. 20% of it's original, so he's changed a lot out and, and made some improvements to some of the things that were problem, I think it's the vi viscous coupling on the uh, fans, so it's uh, he has a fans controllable from the inside of the cabin. So it's just a, I would presume electrically at that point. Uh, yes, yes, and he changed the lights, and he changed the lights and some other things. But um, it's just a neat little, it's the neat thing. It's well, that's, almost that's the beauty of the Defender is you can change these things about it, and you can make it what you need it to be, and you can get rid of the things you don't want. Yes. And it and it's a it's a this video here it's like three minutes it's a genteel version of the Top Gear it doesn't go fast uh, series the hamster the hamster one yeah it was really nice but yeah go ahead and so see. one could do a side by side on YouTube and, and watch both videos and... yeah and after fashion sure yeah it's just fun it's just nice it's it's an homage it's a nice it's a nice uh, uh, see why people like the vehicle, why they're they're in touch with it, and and why, I guess I'll use the word love, and why they're you know they kind of love the vehicle, and it, you know, he he talks more about the positives than the negatives. Uh, well, there are more of them, certainly for those of us who are involved in them. That's right, of course. And and, and he, I, I, that was one of the interesting points he made, and I tend to agree with, is you have a relationship with the vehicle, unlike a lot of other vehicles that you typically don't have a say a relationship with it, um, or as I call a road going appliance. There are many road-going appliances. I mean, I guess they have their 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 purpose in society, but I don't know. I, I have a hard time driving something that I can't have uh, some sort of relationship with. Next up is trail reports. Now, our normal trail folks are not available. Unfortunately, they're not on the trail. Yeah, but... you'd think they'd be on the trail, but somehow <laughs> they they're not. They should be. They should be. <laughs> if they're not going to be here, they should be on the trail. <laughs> uh, there are trails, there are trail rides coming up. Uh, in two or three weeks is the... Uh, Wilds uh, event out in Ohio, and uh, I plan to go to that. That's a, over Father's Day weekend here in the United States. Actually, it was scheduled to the week after Father's Day this year uh, um, on special, oh. special, special reasoning. Special reasoning. Bill which, Burke will show. Yes, uh, Bill Burke will be coming, and it will be the week after Father's Day weekend. So you have an extra week to get ready. I do, I do, and I have a truck that I can take now that seems to be prepared and ready to rock and roll. Which means maybe we don't need it to be a week later. It gives That's you extra right. time to break it. <laughs> maybe I just shouldn't drive it as much. Oh, heaven forbid. No, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm still going to drive it. But we'll, uh, our next podcast, we should have a report for you from that event, if all goes well. Um, June's a pretty busy month for me, though, so we'll see. Uh, yeah, I gotta, I have to go to Boston for work, and our normal, normal recording day, I'll be getting back. So we'll That's see. a long drive in the 109. 
Yeah, yeah, that's not going to happen. I'm going to fly. Uh, then there's a, a new event to turn about. The Vermont Overland folks are having a Vermont Overland Rover, so over the Land Rover uh, event. Uh, I think if you get my reading of that, July 25th and 27th, uh, the Northeast Land Rover Rally, and that'll take place in Vermont. Uh, I'm guessing it looks to be uh, it's a less structured event. And just to kind of enjoy the uh, you know the the off roading and the and the fun and events up there. So and this is not the actual Vermont Overland event. Then. No, this looks like to be a kind of a Land Rover specific. I don't want to say only, but it looks like a Land Rover specific event. Kind of a, a Vermont Overland light, if you will. Yes, yes. Uh, there is, uh, however, they're restricted to two hundred vehicles, uh, one hundred twenty five dollars per vehicle, and they expect to fill it and quickly. That's a lot of vehicles. That is a lot of vehicles. So there's, uh, but yeah, they have a extensive uh, trail network over 200 acre farm, and uh, so that should be fun had by all. So if anybody gets to go and wants to report on it before, after, or during, we'll have to happy to hear that. There are events that are also going on in the UK at the moment. I've seen them on the Facebook. Unfortunately, I don't uh, follow that as closely as I should exactly what they are. I rely on other people to help out with that, and they are not available to report in on that. Uh, so hopefully we'll have some uh, future reports on S there's an Estmore event, and there is another event coming up. I apologize. Of course, the summer is full of all sorts of shows in, in the England uh, area. Uh, lots and lots of uh, military-type shows that some of our ex-military friends go to. And uh, you know, I don't know the schedule on those either, but I, I see the pictures of them online, and they look yeah. like fabulous they events. do they do yeah, there's a small chance i might get to go to the uk next uh, june so i'm starting to look at the events that pop up and maybe i get to actually attend one or two of them next year if all goes well that's always been a dream of mine but i'm not sure when i'll be able to make that happen yeah yeah well uh, work is taking me to the, to europe so i might uh, take some vacation time and hang on hang out the uk your job really sucks doesn't it <laughs> Another event coming up this summer that, that I heard about, and I really don't m know much about it, but I'm, I'm kind of anxious to learn about. Uh, there's something coming up called the Muddy Chef Challenge. Muddy Chef? Yeah, it's, I believe it's in New England somewhere. Uh, they're going to have a, it's a, of course, a rover trail event, but as part of the event, it's also a cooking competition. And you have to cook... Uh, at or near your rover in the campsite, basically. You're cooking in the campsite. You're not cooking on the engine, are you? Uh, well, I, I don't believe that would be against the rules, uh, but uh, it's not necessarily required. But I think there are style points given for creative cooking materials and techniques, uh, but it is a, a camping uh, trailside cooking competition as part of the event. It is a weekend event combining off-roading and vehicle-based gourmet cooking challenge. Think the great race meets top shelf. Several years ago, a large group of Lake Muddy Land Rover owners got together in Stowe, Vermont for the first Muddy Chef Challenge. And that will take place July 31 through August 3rd at the Lime Rock Motorsports Park in Lakeview, Lakeville, Connecticut. Well, there you go. Rovers North is sponsoring it and a couple other organizations. Land Rover itself, apparently, is also uh, sponsoring the event. So, I wonder if they could get Gordon Ramsay to bring his Range Rover. That'd be nice. Yes, yes. Might be a little bit unfair competition. That's true. I wonder, I wonder how well he drives off-road. Well, that would be the, the thing there. Can he drive off-road? Uh, we'll have a link to the Muddy Chef Challenge, which is muddychef.com. There's also a uh, Facebook page. I don't know if you joined that, Harold, or not. There's a Facebook page for the Muddy Chef Challenge. I think That's I have it. seen that. Okay. And also coming up uh, this summer is the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix. And the, if you're not familiar with the Grand Prix, it's actually a pretty cool event. It takes place here in Pittsburgh, where we are. Uh, they race. It's the only, what, the only? It is the only vintage racing event that takes place on city streets. streets. And it takes place in Chenley Park, uh, which are city streets. And they race around the park, close it off in, what, I think anything up to 1962 or something? Is that the cutoff? I don't remember the actual rules, but but generally speaking, anything that's eligible for vintage racing uh, sanctioning bodies typically would, would be 
uh, eligible to compete in this race as well. At the uh, this year's mark is the mini. The, uh, so that's they uh, every year they have a different mark, and uh, that's part of the international car show, which runs in conjunction to the to the race itself. Well, uh, well, no, the mark of the year is just for the whole event. Right. And then, but yes, and the reason we bring it up, of course, is about the Inter International Car Day that they have, uh, which also includes British Car Day. Yeah, uh, British Car Day being one of the biggest British car shows in the country, and it actually runs as a uh, sort of Shakespearean, if you will, show within the show. It's Saturday of, a, of the whole weekend car show, and Saturday only is British Car Day. And that will take place on the third weekend in July this year, and I plan to be there. Um, I think you're going to be there with something. I or usually you... try to go with something. <laughs> and we try to get a nice, uh, nice. We've I know in the last couple of years we've increased the Land Rover uh, section of the of British Car Day, doubled if not tripled, it doubled if not tripled, and um, so we'll be there. So if you are in the Pittsburgh area, it's a neat event, and you're going to be out and about. Look us up and say hi. Um, so we'll be there, and that is the Vintage Grand Prix. There will, of course, be a link to uh, Vintage Grand Prix on the website, which is simply pvgp.org, Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix, and then there's links to the British Car Day if you want to know more about that. They also have, It's actually International Car Day. There's German cars, European cars, American cars. There's a lot of cars. Actually, it, the International Car Show runs both days, Saturday and Sunday. Sunday. It's a full weekend yeah. event. Yeah, there's a lot of triumph, and you know I've said this before, and I'll probably say it a number of times. I'm just amazed at the number of cars that show up that come out of the woodwork that or actually come out of the garages, and just show up at this event that you never see any other time. There's you know there's Aston Martins, there's Range Rover, uh, uh, Rolls Royces, Bentleys, tons of Triumphs, uh, Minis, and then there's you know, there's always some weird one-off things. There was an Isetta a couple of years ago. Uh, they had uh, Subaru brought out that. Uh, P3000? It was this really small car. I mean, it wasn't the style. That would be the 360. There's the 360. That was it. That was a cool car. That was neat. It just These things that show up. Just, Legal in only 49 states. It was outlawed in New Jersey because of insufficient brakes. There you go. So that's the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix. It's Isn't actually a fabulous car show in its own right. But given that it's in conjunction with this vintage race, it really is a must-see event. It is, yes. And, uh, you know, bring your earplugs, because it gets loud when the race cars get zipping around, which, of course, adds to the atmosphere, but if you have sensitive ears, bring some plugs. Also, we, uh, out and about as we speak, you may recall that last podcast we talked to Steve, who was heading from the U.K. to the Arctic Circle. Now, I'm happy to report that he has achieved the Arctic Circle. He's there as we speak. And I would love to say, and now let's go to Steve. Unfortunately, uh, due to some technical reasons, we can't speak with him right now. He was lined up and ready to go, and then he had to back out yesterday for some technical reasons. So maybe I'll get to talk to him later this week. Uh, and if not, definitely we'll talk to him for the next podcast. So there's a small chance there might be a special podcast if we get to talk to him. So he has breached the circle. He has breached the circle, and he now has a sticker on his Defender that says he has gotten to the Arctic Circle, and there's the latitude and longitude, and it's, it's uh, so it's, hey, hey, you got a sticker on the back, it's, of course it's happened. I've been to the Arctic Circle, and all I got was this crappy sticker. Pretty much. And, and the neat little thing, too, he was there on his birthday. Well, that was his goal, I think, wasn't it? I think it was, yes. He he said he's going, he actually took a day off, quote-unquote, uh, because he was kind of ahead of schedule. Uh, he has a uh, a blog, and I'll have a link to that on our show notes. I think there's one on the existing show notes too from the last podcast. But he's a blog, and he's been filling that filling that out as he's been going. He should be careful not to talk too much about being ahead of schedule because the rover gods don't like that. <laughs> Good point. Good point. But he's got some really nice photos. Uh, he is currently, as of uh, this recording and his last posting, which was day nine, he is on the Atlantic Road. And you may recall we talked about that last time. Looked at some of those really cool photos uh, from the last at the last podcast. And it's eight kilometers long, and it's supposed to be this really slick. Uh, the full route is around. I'm reading his blog right now. The full route is around 36 kil kilometers long, which is about 22 miles in other places. Um, so and he says here, so why did I clock up about 50 miles and take six hours to cover it? <laughs> Apparently it's a fun ride and lots of good photos. So uh, 
So Steve, Steve is doing well. He's made it. I've uh, exchanged a couple emails with him in the past uh, month, and so all is going well. And I wanted to thank him too for uh, saying nice things about us on the on his blog. And he was all excited that someone outside of his mother uh, was interested in his travel. So I think it's a it it. I mean, it sounds pretty routine in a way the way he brings it, but it's actually pretty cool that someone's uh, he took a ferry and went to Europe and. Drove all the way up through, uh, I think, what Belgium, and then took it uh, into Sweden, right? Sweden, and then to Norway and Arctic Circle. So, how many people do that? Not me. <laughs> yeah, you you can barely get to uh, you can barely get over to Europe to go to these cool shows, let alone take a trip, take a take a truck and drive up to the Arctic Circle. Well, I haven't been to Europe since 1978. So, really, wow, your passport good. Not so much. No, jeez. Okay, you got to keep your passport in order. Yeah. Well. No. Yeah. Well, maybe you could you could drive to the Arctic Circle here on on our side. It takes a passport to do that now, too. Yeah, it does actually. Mm-hmm. Sadly. You got a good truck for it though. Take the ambulance and trundle up there. Well, let me get it running, and then we'll talk about that. <laughs> so that is Steve. I was, I guess, and we were hoping to talk with him a little more, but maybe we will uh, in. The future. Well, definitely we'll have to hear from him when he gets done. Right. So finally on the podcast, uh, we've had some uh, some nice comments. Uh, for us, they were nice, and they were few, but they're still comments. And we're actually them, getting feedback. Woohoo! We, we actually, exactly, we actually had feedback. So the first thing is uh, we had a, a gentleman, uh, I might as well call him out by name, right? Derek, uh, looks like he lives in Missoula. Is that Mon? No, Missouri. I don't know where I get Missoula from. Anyways, Derek, who lives in Missouri, actually commented on our Facebook page and uh, had some was was nice. And he wanted to hear a little more tech talk. And conveniently, Derek, uh, you uh, had posted that just before the last podcast, and and Harold M Word had covered, in fact, had covered some tech talk. So hopefully that helped you out. Uh, if not. Let us know. Maybe we'll see what we can do for you. You can also browse through the back issues of the Center Share podcast. We do cover some technical topics from time to time, uh, but we'll try to add more if that's the kind of thing you're looking for. And anyone else who's listening and hasn't commented already, uh, which is, I guess, most of the people haven't, uh, for something you want to hear about, let us know. We'll do our best to incorporate it into the show. Uh, you know, we do we do this monthly, and uh, we'll and, you know we talk about things that I guess we enjoy and we like, and kind of play to us. I like electric cars, and so I tend to talk about that too. And Harold has his things he likes to talk about racing and such. So, but if there's something you want to talk about, we want to hear about it. And I can usually find something to say about most anything that's put in front of me. So let us know what you want to hear. And secondly, I had a, an email exchange uh, with a gentleman in Vermont. Uh, his first name immediately eludes me. It wasn't Morgan, was it? it? No, it was not. He doesn't know Morgan. I did ask him. Uh, it's actually Chris. And uh, he said, and, and this was, in fact, an oversight on our part, so it's also important to correct it. Uh, he says, we've mentioned all different types of Land Rovers, but not about a 101 Ford Control. And he sent a picture. He needs to listen more because we do talk about the 101 Forward Control. It's been a while. I don't know that we, but it's, we we typically it's maybe been a few episodes. It's been, yes. but we also don't mention it as part of the normal lineup. Well, I it's, think that's uh, yeah, because it's not, of course, part of the normal model lineup. But uh, you know, the one hundred and one forward control was really a limited production, military only vehicle. It is a cool Land Rover. It is one yes. I would like to add to my fleet, most definitely. Absolutely. There's there's a lot in. Uh, in Canada, uh, I think, because I think their import rules are, are less than the United States. 15 years versus 25, but I don't think they've made any forward control since 1976. So really, anybody can get one if they want one. They only made them for two or three years. Oh, really? I didn't know that. And only a few thousand. Okay. Oh, I thought it was part of. I thought it was part of the military. Oh no, it was. Stuff. It was originally developed. The GS was uh, developed as an artillery tractor. And then they produced a uh, radio truck version uh, in 24 volts and an ambulance. The 101 ambulance is really cool, by the way. I have seen one. There's apparently there's one in Montreal. And I, we, we were up at the OVLR birthday party. This had to be 2005, 2006. And there was, uh, there was a converted uh, ambulance into a camper. Oh, that was, that was really nice. And, you know, the cool thing about that is that 
first off, you can almost stand up in the back of a 101 ambulance, which, of course, is uh, so much better than a Series 3 ambulance where you can almost sit up. <laughs> but uh, also the other really cool thing about the 101 ambulance is that the stretcher racks uh, have hydraulic lifts on them. So if you keep that portion and just add your mattresses, you can hide, push a button and lift your beds up out of the way during the day. Wow. That's slick. Isn't that cool? That is very cool. That is, is, is in fact, very cool. Wow. So Steve sent along uh, – Steve, my apologies, Chris uh, – sent along a, a photo of – he actually has a 101. And he sent a nice photo of that. It has a sticker on the side that's tough to read. Uh, 48 something and he's in Vermont so if you're in Vermont and you see his 101 wave to him as you're supposed to it's quite likely going to be him <laughs> quite likely uh, more likely though he'll be running around in his 110 um, red uh, Defender 110 which looks really nice has a snorkel that's a nice looking vehicle and so that's a little shout out to uh Shout out to Chris. Thanks for contacting us. Nice pictures there. Appreciate you saying those along. A nice combination of vehicles, Chris. Good taste. Good, yes. tr good uh, choice. I should mention, I apologize, uh, the, one oh, the 101 is a radio body. So he did mention that. I should. I wanted to point that out. So I wonder if it's still 24 volts or whether he's, he's converted it. Maybe we'll hear back from him after he listens to the episode. That'd be cool. And maybe we should get him to call into the podcast and talk <laughs> about his fleet. It's not a bad idea. It's not a bad idea. He does know Tim. Uh, listener ride section. It's a good idea. Maybe we'll consider that. Listener ride. I like that. All right. So that is, uh, those are comments. We haven't had a lot, but two is wonderful for us. It's good. We're still small. We're still developing. And uh, so we're trying to build, build listeners. Feel free to tell your friends about the podcast and uh, let us know what else you may want to hear about or what you Maybe you don't want to hear about. Well, no, no, that's probably not going to stop us, though. I also want to talk about the things I want to talk about. You can tell us what you don't want to hear. It's not going to stop us from saying it, but feel free. And this concludes the May 2014 edition of the Center Steer Podcast, uh, podcast number 14. I want to thank you for listening. And if you have any comments, suggestions, questions, feel free to contact us uh, through our website, through Facebook, through Twitter. Um, and let us know what you think. Always uh, happy to hear and maybe interact with you. That's kind of adds to the fun. If you have something special that you do or it's interesting and you maybe want to join us on the podcast for recording, we're also open to those ideas. So contact us through those methods also. Thanks again for listening, and we'll talk to you next month. See you. The Center Steer theme song, Sunset Rider by the Tritons, is available from Nibio's Music Alley. Check it out at music.nibio.com. Pause while we figure this out.